Hey everyone ever, and welcome to 20th Century Popcast, the show where we try to understand the present while living in the past. My name is Tim Blevins, and guess who is not here today? Den Home Elliot? Right. Uh, Toya Wilcox? Not present. Usagi Ojimbo? No, because I sold all my Ninja Turtles on eBay last year. But um, also, and I'm sorry to say, Bob Canning is still not here. My, my, my co-host, my beautiful co-host who, well, there were outtakes last week with him, but in terms of a professional podcast capacity, he hasn't been here since, um, well, since the Raiders of the Lost Ark episode. It's a timing issue that he's not here. It, it, it's a quality issue. Not that he's not here, but more like fidelity issues. Um, not the bank, but um, that's, that's an audio issue, right? Fidelity? High high, high fidelity? It, it's, it's a book that I read before the movie. But yeah, what uh, What about Bob? When is he back on? And am, am I the cause of this absence? I'm sorry, I guess, in a roundabout way i am the cause look here's the thing though we we record this show in different time zones so there can be an issue of coordinating when we are um both what when we're both available and bob was on a family vacation but you know he's been back for a few weeks now during which we've been able to arrange one uh recording session we we have recorded an episode actually about 1991 summer movies and i don't know i i think it was the heat but that conversation that we had, I mean, maybe we'll play it still, maybe. It just, it didn't fully feel up to our normal, you know, interactions, which maybe I'm being overcritical, but, uh, geez, now if I put it up, now if I put it up, you have no reason to listen to it. God, look, either way, we, what we need, what we do need is to get him back on co-hosting duties. That's what you need. That's what I need. So hopefully next week, uh, we'll see. Sorry to put that on your shoulders. That's what you need. You might be fine. You know, you, you, you might be okay. You, you might be better if he was here, but, uh, he's not this week. He's not. I am. And to be honest, I'm here and I'm in mourning. Um, I'm mourning. I'm also recording this in the morning, uh, Wednesday morning, but Look, here's here's why, I guess. Here's what we're talking about today. Here's the topic. Steve Ditko passed away this week, and you're probably not asking who's Steve Ditko because as Facebook, Twitter, well, the internet, and just modern culture has been able to demonstrate the world pretty much knows Steve Ditko and his contribution to to the character Spider-Man. You know, he designed the look of Spider-Man. And, and, and you know Spider-Man because you exist now. You know, he was a comic book artist who worked for Marvel in the 60s on Spider-Man, you know, a, a run of Doctor Strange. And he moved over to DC where I think he worked on like Shade the Changing Man and other topics I could have researched. Uh, he was an artist in the 60s and a name and, and a signature that was branded on some collections of comics that rested on the bookshelf of my brother's bookcase growing up. You know, his name was there inside these compilations called uh, Origins of Marvel Comics and Son of Origins of Marvel Comics, two early versions of graphic novels that had 60s issues of, of Marvel Comics reprinted. And if you flip through it, inside of these books, right alongside the name Jack Kirby, um, there was Steve Ditko. You know, and, and I knew Steve Ditko was uh, was important, you know, and I, I knew this from, I guess, from my teenage years, you know, maybe my preteen years. But to look through far too many of uh, of my comic book long boxes, you know, which represent an ongoing collection that probably started with a Whitman's Battle of the Planets issue in 1979 and was updated as recently as issue two of Brian Michael Bendis's What Man of Steel series. Um, but to look at that collection, I don't have a single polybagged issue of, of Steve Ditko's work. Not a single issue. I've got Spider-Mans, the, the Spider-Men, you know, amazing, spectacular web of Peter Porker. He's no stranger to my collection because, again, he's fucking Spider-Man and I live now. You know, I think I had one hardcover uh, Marvel Masterpiece collection that had the first 10 issues of Spider-Man in it. 
And I believe that held Steve Ditko's work in it. But, you know, I long ago re-gifted that to somebody who was a bigger Spider-Man fan, you know, the same way I dig old Howard the Duck. So how exactly did Steve Ditko impact me? And what what does it mean that I'm mourning the loss of a life, you know, I didn't even know personally? I mean, am I internalizing this? Making it all about my own fears of aging, my own obsession with finality, this fear of death that, I, you know, that just replays itself into my fading loss of childhood and fuels the nostalgia that powers the engine of this very podcast? Sure, I am totally using the death of a comic book legend as a springboard to explore something centered inside of me, because that's how we record podcasts. But it's also our relationship with art, you know, pop or others. And, and, and Steve Ditko is one of the greats of pop art. And I am recording a very last minute episode of a podcast. So, you know, feels like a Vulcan mind meld to me. But the why, the why of this episode, why, why shed a tear for the demise of, of Steve Ditko? There's been a lot of reflection on it, a lot of commentary and tributes and retrospective think pieces all across uh, Twitter, Facebook, and what is still called the internet. Some of this is from fellow artists, you know, some is that worked with him or alongside him, or at least in the medium that he worked in comics. Some of these are from news outlets. And most of what I read is from people I happen to be friends with, you know, or at least friends in the Facebook sense. Plenty of individuals were commenting on his passing this, uh, this past week. I read sentences, so many sentences, you know, each accompanying a carefully curated piece of his own artwork, you know, most often the the second Doctor Strange image to come up under a Google search for Steve Ditko art. You know, these were meant as meaningful confessionals from people who felt, at least in that particular day, that their lives would have been less stable and more about childhood misery if it wasn't for the illustrative edition of all the sequential panels Steve Ditko ever illustrated. And look, I was one of these voices. My very carefully worded and spell-checked tweet, typed while descending underground at the Kenmore Tea Stop, took a preachy, what, indulgent turn by declaring this. And I'm quoting my own tweet. I'm sorry. Think for a moment of hashtag Steve Ditko. And then think how different childhood would have looked without him. Rest in eternity, sir. Uh, End quote. A quote that was accompanied with the proper picture of Dr. Strange addressing the uh, cosmic deity eternity that, in retrospect, I hope was drawn by Steve Ditko, you know, in an issue of Dr. Strange that I never read. Um, But that sentence, that was my immediate, um, well, after second drafting, eight minute later reaction to the the shared Facebook uh, musings of a friend of mine that was alerting me to to Steve Ditko's passing at 90. And I hashtagged it, uh, Steve Ditko, to make sure I would be counted amongst the comic book scholars who were mourning the loss you know, of, what, of who they considered one of their own. It's a hashtag that received quite the morbid bump that evening as I, don't, I, I, I personally don't recall seeing anything in my feed revolving around Steve Ditko the day before. And that's not his fault. I mean, the guy was 90. He may not even have been on Twitter. I mean, he may have been retired, and it's not his responsibility to maintain a presence in my face so I can claim we're like-minded when it suits me. I mean, look, I like the Spider-Man character. He was a Saturday morning staple of my childhood, but I wasn't reading those Steve Ditko issues, you know, not till later in life. It's not like I'm reading Spider-Man now. I, I I didn't even choose a Spider-Man image to attach to my initial tweet. Um, I But I did attach that picture because I have read that when you tweet with photo attachments, you'll get more online engagement. And that's also why the hashtag's there. We all want to be counted in our statements about Steve Ditko. Otherwise, you would say it to yourself or to the actual friends sitting actually next to you and 
you know, if, if, if you knew Steve Ditko personally, you'd, you'd probably contact his next of kin and maybe mourn at a memorial service later this week. But, but, but no, I and other people on Facebook, we announced it via the master click bait medium that designates most of us broadcasters or, or journalists or, or just internet celebrities. So what's the deal with the selfish indulgence, Tim? Why are you turning off voluntary listeners by berating their own online practices through, an, through this assumption of, 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 of your own? Well, actually, because human beings like to prove others wrong. But alongside of that, because berating others is how I cope. I try to alienate myself, detach from the group, isolate into some greater understanding of the universal joke. And if I can piggyback that onto a public display of my own fear of mortality, then yeah, I'm going to record a whole special episode about it. An episode that isn't even about Steve Ditko, the way the title at the top brandishes his name. It's, this isn't a retrospective. It's not like it's some lost interview with the man. It, 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 it's a self-driven attempt to understand the tenuous at best relationship I have with childhood imagery, uh, with, with, with memorabilia, nostalgia, I guess, is what everyone likes to derogatorily call it. But in this case, specifically superheroes, comic book superheroes, Marvel superheroes, to be exact, the things that meant the most to me growing up that as I grew up, I realized had not only been there for me, but had been there for a while, you know, not the longest while, but someone at some point uh, put fingers to work on a piece of paper and generated out of the other, the original version of that thing that I decided defines my existence. Look, Spider-Man didn't always exist as a bedspread lunchbox or under Rue. At, at one point, he existed on a piece of scrap paper, and moments before that, as merely a conundrum needing to be solved. And, you know, I doubt, as, as Steve Ditko sketched out the frightening and non-spider-colored appearance that deemed Spider-Man recognizable as Spider-Man, you know, I, I doubt that he was thinking one day this character would break box office records by looking like Tobey Maguire. You know, it was a drawing that he did, an interpretation of a collaboration between him and, and, and another name that needs no introduction, Stan Lee. He was the artist, Stan Lee was the writer, and, and they combined those talents to tell a single, simple story that, that, that allowed this perception of a character to flip around in New York City. And you know what? That issue would have been it. Another random story stashed in someone's basement for a sick day. Just a too stapled piece of pulp yellowing with age, but the reality is there is value to that book and a high financial one, as eBay can attest, but <clears throat> folded and battered, battered as that issue uh, may have been. The secret to creativity is hidden away inside that splash page credits box. Look, the reality that there is a name on that, that an individual put forth this drawing and that drawing went on to feed a whole issue and that issue spawned an ongoing series and the ongoing series found its way into our basement. No, I mean, maybe not that issue, but with that character, the fact that there is now a line of lineage tracing a single day home with a chicken pox back to a pen marked moment of initial artistry with a signature you weren't even seeing yet, that, that, that's actually important. That's wildly influential, and that is how childhoods are built. I mean, I don't think the creators matter to us as kids. When we first saw Spider-Man, it wasn't to learn who was penciling those poses or letter, lettering the dialogue. We liked Spider-Man because we liked Spider-Man. We followed his adventures because they were fun. You know, they're, they're colorful. And he had two amazing friends that if cosplaying was a thing in 1983 Connecticut, eight-year-old me would have been flicking Bix and popping cold ones in a non-fitting yellow jumpsuit with red mask 
highlights, Spider-Man motivated us as kids to strike an iconic pose that we knew everyone knew, to hand jive an imaginary web, to, to flip our action figures around over a cardboard skyline, to, to sketch out our own makeshift outfits while slinging clever quips both as quotes and originals. We exhausted ourselves, exhausted ourselves mentally and physically through the imaginary antics of this friendly neighborhood superhero. A hero that would not have existed if not for the chosen pen strokes of 1960s Steve Ditko. His slapdash last ditch illustrated effort to starve off a canceled book turned out to be the most recognizable costume crusader this side of the one that wore a cape. And that was a human being drawing what has since become modern myth. And that's what I think about when these creative artists pass on. They were flesh and blood storytellers with faults, you know, and neuroses, like all of us. They wore torn shirts. They worked in dingy office settings and and bought their supplies at dusty secondhand stores. And they brainstormed titles and crumbled up sketches and and, and abandoned concepts, all to make a 22-page piece of what mistakenly was labeled at the time as disposable entertainment. And then, Spider-Man took off. You know, he was popular. And for a bit, there were only two stories with him. And then that launched the series. You know, and then he started guesting in other books. And soon the character was being passed about, you know, plotted by other authors, rendered by various artists, some borrowing from and building on what came before. And before time needed to be measured, he's on a cartoon. He's on a 7-Eleven glass. He's on our walls, our t-shirts, our bookshelves, our Christmas lists, and our imaginations. (sighs) Spider-Man became this icon of the 20th century that everyone knew and still knows. That's so much larger and so much more impactive than any one owner of a single signature could have ever anticipated or, or even intended. Steve Ditko had a hand in the modern pantheon. You know, like the Greek gods, however many eons before. His idea has spiraled and taken on a life that is mythic. He, Steve Ditko, was one of the myth makers. And we don't think of myths, or at least I don't, as having single authors. You know, I think of them as archetypes. as just part of the greater experience. But as a kid with interest in comics... You know, as you get a little older, you can do a little research, you know, and you can start to notice those little credit boxes on the page and you'll start to see names, names that repeat, names that start to matter, names you want to read. So you start to follow those names from issue to issue, then book to book. And over time, you come to realize that there is a creative force behind these stories that that people you know, actual flesh, blood, hair, human beings tell these stories. And as a kid, if you're a fan of these stories, you realize that you can actually tell these stories. You are a human being. You can talk about Spider-Man. And that right there, that simple two-sentence realization is why Steve Ditko is important. The fact that a name belonging to a face is attached to something, something as impactive to the world as Spider-Man, means that you as an individual can make something of impact. Because you have a name, you know? Your name's not Spider-Man, and you didn't make Spider-Man, but, you know, that's one that's been done already. But, you know, when you're a kid, or or maybe when you're a teen, or maybe when you're a 20, or or 30, or now something, uh, you know, knowing the name behind the art that you love is a reminder that you can also make art that you love. It was vital to me to learn that individuals worked on comic books, that they could, that I could. These myths were being told by people, and I, I, I was people, so I could tell it too. Having a name like Steve Ditko on Spider-Man meant I could also be a myth maker, and that's what making art is. You know, telling a mythic story whose life extends beyond yours. So, in the passing of Steve Ditko, 
or witnessing the passing of another myth maker, you know, like Bill Finger, Bob Kane, you know, Jim Henson to jump mediums there. When the mortal voice behind these characters finally shuffles off from existence, the art that endures, it, it stands on its own. It becomes or, or, or remains or, or whatever, you know, just it continues as Spider-Man, Wonder Woman, or, or Kermit the Frog. When the myth makers pass, their work is more mythic. And, and truthfully, Spider-Man became mythic a long time ago, long before we were all discussing Steve Ditko. But that's probably OK that we've been discussing Steve Ditko. You know, it, it, it's, it's probably why we're discussing Steve Gitko and, 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 and it's how we still try to tether ourselves, you know, here in adulthood to these mythic things that were so big when we were a child, you know, and now we can peer behind the curtain, you know, and understand that our childhood reactions, seeing old webhead, mock, doc, ock, those images came from someone, you know, a human being was involved, and by stating this, by making this our real realization, it makes us involved too. You know, it's selfish, but not harmful. I mean, there are people who knew Steve Ditko as a person, and they are the ones who were interacting with him for the past 30 years. They have mourning, you know, to do. But, you know, they also have our mourning there online to read. And maybe our own statements into that inter-ether, maybe our fandom-flung diatribes about how important this work was to us, maybe that offers some solace to the memory of the man, you know, to the people who knew him as that. We mourn the loss of creative artists because it's heart-wrenching to think of them as human. And as humans, you know, frail, we are saddened to know the mind and heart that bled into our own childhood has faded because that's the tenuous connection we have. You know, we will all fade. But this impact, the myth, you know, the myth that Steve Ditko gave us, the myth that he partook in, that, that somehow continues because... Somehow Spider-Man is bigger than all of us and personal to all of us. And this earth wouldn't have had that if, if the earth hadn't had Steve Ditko. So um, to reshare myself, Think for a moment of Steve Ditko, and then think how different childhood would have looked without him. Rest in eternity, sir. God, I'm a selfish prick. That is the program for the week, folks. So thank you for listening, as I say every week since two weeks ago. Uh, hopefully Bob will be back next show. But until then, and after it, uh, you can always visit 20popcast.com. It's the main website for the show you just listened to. Uh, the most recent episode is always up, as well as links to all past episodes. You can also subscribe to the show on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, and Google Play, just to name a few. That way you get a new episode every week. And if you do subscribe to us on Apple Podcasts and you have a moment, uh, leave a little review or, or a rating. Positive if you like us, less so if you don't. Um, it helps our egos as well as getting a wider audience. Uh, you can follow me on Twitter and on Instagram, both at, subcoast, at subcultist. You know what? My mouth is very dry. So before I take the sip, I'm going to ask you real quickly to like the show on Facebook. I encourage you to like the show on Facebook. And, you know... If you do listen to it, do one of those things I just said. It helps. It helps us grow. It helps us get wider. It helps us gain an audience that will demand Bob come back so you don't have to just hear me ramble for nearly half an hour again next week. Oh, next week. What are we talking about? Hopefully, something with Bob. Or maybe a selfish monologue with me. Uh, that is the show, people. That's what it sounded like, so... 
that's what you get. It's a short one. 